Good afternoon. Mike Spires here, joining me, Jacob Perrell and Caleb Perrell. And we are about to embark on our third in a series of five college football, or six college football previews, excuse me, and uh, of the major conferences, the power conferences. Uh, if you uh, tuned into our first couple of podcasts, we looked at the Pac-12 North Division and then, of course, the Pac-12 South Division. Well, today we will uh, move over to the uh, Midwestern part of the country, uh, except for uh, one or two teams that are not actually in that footprint. But still, we will take a look at the Big 12 Conference today. And uh, looking forward to this preview, the high-flying action of the Big 12 Conference. Uh, Kevin, you want to run down our sponsors because without them, this would not be possible. Sure. Well, the sponsors for today are Deep Productions, Deep and Deeper Cleaning, Timber County Middle School, Timber County Chamber of Commerce, Merchants and Citizens Bank, Silver Pins, and Bank of Lumber City. Yeah, and also with the bank, I forgot there, the Bank of Lumber City Branch, Telford County That's Bank, great. is also part of that. So thanks to these fine sponsors because without this, these sponsors, we would not be able to bring you this program. We're a picturesque setting here, uh, live the top Trojan field in the press box as the field looks great. Getting, they're getting it ready for the big game tomorrow night between uh, Telford County and Wheeler County. The Border War. The Border War, that's exactly right. And so they've got the, uh, the cross-country team has been practicing out here. They've been doing a lot of running on this warm day, getting conditioned for the season. And so without further ado, we will move along now and jump right into our preview of the Big 12 Conference. Uh, guys, last year, the uh, Big 12 Conference has 10 teams. Uh, at one time, it had 12 teams, therefore the name. But, you know, back a few years ago, we had the major shifts in college football with realignment. Teams left the conference, and then they added back a couple, but they did not go back to 12 teams, but kept the, kept the name. But last year, out of 10 teams, guys, this conference placed eight of the ten in bowl games. That's that's eighty percent. So that tells you it was it was a pretty strong conference as a whole. Oh yeah, without a doubt, and and especially you think about um going into the college football playoff, you had especially you had Oklahoma going in and playing the Georgia Bulldogs here. that played a historic Rose Bowl. Yes. And then you, but just as a whole, the Big Twelve like put up some great numbers last year. I mean, you really couldn't have said it any better. They high flying offenses of. The Big 12. I mean, just a classic year for the for that conference as a whole. Yeah, no doubt about it. And Caleb, they went five and three as a conference in bowl games. So pretty good overall, especially compared to the Pac-12 that was one and eight. It, exactly. I thought a lot of your well knowns so that you would figure SEC and uh, ACC were you know were moving bowl games away, but it but just like you just said, it was it was the Big 12. For, for, to me, pretty much ran away with the, the record lines anyway. Yeah, the SEC, I can't remember exactly how it was really, really strong. It was a little better, I think. But this is a very respectable performance from a conference that is known for offense. Yes. Oh, yes, without a doubt. I mean, literally, for somebody who's a college football fan, of course, I mean, people around this this area of the nation, of course, were a diehard SEC fans. But if you want to see some points put on the board, that's where you need to watch some football at. Yeah, we talked about the Pac-12 being offensive, but... <laughs> the Big 12 takes it to another level. Exactly. Your uh, Oklahoma, uh, Texas Tech, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State, and Mike Gundy. Uh, you know, several of those teams were the high flying offense, and maybe every other Saturday they play defense. Yeah, yeah and, and actually, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you, if you look at the um, rivalry between the two Oklahoma schools, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, didn't. Uh, didn't both of them top the 50 points yes, range yes. in this last year's game? Uh, didn't one of them get into the 70s, I think? Right, it was 62 to 50. Okay, 62 to 52. So you had over 100 points scored in a game. I mean, if, if you look at the um, you look at the SEC, ACC, or other conferences along the Eastern Seaboard, I mean, you you hardly are going to see that. No, no doubt about it. I mean, it, it was crazy. It was, sorry, go ahead, Mike. But wasn't it also, it was over 600 yards of total offense for both teams? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so over, uh, well over 1,200, probably in the 13. I think it set a record for total said, offense yeah. in the mm -hmm. game. It, it was absolutely sick. It was basically basketball on grass. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was a tremendous year. 
And, of course, we talked a little bit about the Big 12 and the realignment situation. Uh, last year was the first year that the Big 12 brought back the Big 12 championship game for the first time since uh, their, their days when they were split into two 16 divisions. But they did it a little differently than, than other conferences. What they did, instead of having divisions, uh, everybody played nine conference games. So everybody played a round robin, played each other, and they just took the top two in the standings to play in the championship game, which means you're guaranteed a rematch every single year. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, honestly, that's the most simplest format that you could really go through with. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I mean, you you get the Big 12 champion um, coming out here, which was, I do believe, Oklahoma. Yes, of course, with, the, with Baker Mayfield at the helm. I mean, Oklahoma just had a dominating year, which allowed them, especially with that championship game that they reinstated, got them into the college football playoff, which, I mean, people have said before, right when the playoff was started, I mean, a lot of people were saying there's a lot of great teams in the Big 12, but yet at that time they didn't have a championship game. Yeah. You're not getting in if you do not have a conference champion to be considered. Yeah, but devil's advocate. In a scenario last year, had had TCU upset Oklahoma in that championship game, it could have actually backfired and kept uh, Oklahoma out. Very true. You know, we're seeing TCU versus Georgia. So, or it could have opened the door for uh, for the Ohio State team that oh, finished fifth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so so it can go either way. But I but I do agree that. Uh, having a conference championship game puts at least everybody on the same level. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you're right. Yeah, now, is my understanding, with the Sun Belt, all 10 of the conferences have a championship game. So everybody is on a level playing field except for those, what, six independent schools. Mm -hmm. So the Big 12 moving in the right direction with that. And, I mean, this is a conference, guys. If you remember when all the realignment stuff, it was teetering on the brink there for a little while of this conference just falling apart and going away. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, if you go, go back a couple of years, I mean, I mean, would you say that it kind of started when uh, maybe Texas A&M departed from the conference? It, it started right before that yeah. because basically uh, teams get, got upset with Texas over the Longhorn yeah. Network. Yeah. And <laughs> well, the Texas is Texas. Yeah. They're, they're popular. Mm-hmm. So, and, and it's not, they don't have the, the share, revenue sharing plan that that the big that the Big Ten and SEC have, mm-hmm. so it's not uh, across the board where everybody gets the same amount of money. And you're exactly right. I mean, and with that addition of the Longhorn Network, really, I mean, you look at it, the, the phrase "everything's bigger in Texas" yeah. got into their head. <laughs> yeah, and like we're going to make our own TV network. Uh, revenue sharing is going to be out the window. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so it changed the dynamic, no doubt. It did, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. Didn't they have a commissioner change also? Yes, they also, uh, Bowlesby came in as commissioner. And, uh, you know, when things were teetering on the brink, it appeared at one point that Texas and Texas Tech were both going to the Pac-12, you know, at mm-hmm. one time when all this this uh, came out, and Oklahoma and Oklahoma State with them. So, But things settled down, and right now they brought in, of course, they lost Nebraska uh, to the, uh, went to the Big Ten, Colorado to the Pac-12. Uh, they are uh, Texas A&M to the SEC and Missouri to the SEC. And so they, they lost four and added TCU and West Virginia to get back to 10 teams. And, uh, and actually, that's where we will begin with our preview today is uh, the West Virginia Mountaineers. Do I need a musket to <laughs> shoot up in the air here? Well, there's some roof on this facility, yeah. so we might not do, should do that. that. That's true. And I, I promise I won't sing uh, Country Roads Take Me Home. No. But uh, <laughs> but the West Virginia Mountaineers last year, 7-6 and six overall, 5-4 and four in the Big 12. They were tied with uh, with three other teams. They tied for fourth in the league. Dana Holgerson has, has been there seven years. This will be his eighth season. Uh, they lost 30-14 to 14 to Utah in the Zaxby's Heart of Dallas, though. Yeah, but uh, did the winner of that bowl get some free chicken? I hope so. Yes, <laughs> I, I hope I hope I definitely hope so. But guys, Dana Holgerson, he's known for offense, and, oh, yeah. and they are a high flying football team. I mean, you're exactly right. Especially the uh, the quarterback in his system is suited for a high flying offense. Especially I, I I made mention in some previous show I think to Mister Deep about this guy, but they um. Uh, Quarterback Will Greer there mm-hmm. at West Virginia, very suited for a high-flying offense, once threw for 
uh, 800 plus yards in a single game in high school. So, I mean, if you're looking for a high flying quarterback, I mean, you put up numbers like that in high school and then come into the uh, Big 12 to put up numbers yet again. I mean, a lot of people have actually picked Will Greer to be a Heisman sleeper pick this year as well. I actually think he, he's more than a sleeper. I would put him in my, say, top three or four candidates. You're right. I agree, Mike. When being in this offense, it seems it seems that the Heisman has almost turned to a just quarterback mm-hmm. uh, trophy, and which I mean it's not, but here in the recent we'll say eight years, over fifty percent of the winners were quarterbacks. Yeah. So with Will Greer and Dana Hopkins' offense, that's go go go, and the importance is scoring points. Oh, this yeah. like this may win the Heisman Trophy for him. Yeah, he threw for 3,550 yards last year, 34 touchdowns. And then he had a hand injury that, that uh, ended his season a little early. But a tremendous, tremendous quarterback in this system. And guys, people forget back just a few years before this, uh, Holgerson and uh, this West Virginia team, remember, took on Clemson in the Orange Bowl mm-hmm. and absolutely humiliated. What, 77, I think, or 70? I think that's right. To, I can't remember what Clemson score. It was in the 40s, but it was mm-hmm. just an absolute beatdown on a major stage. Exactly. I mean, the, the Orange Bowl, one of the New Year's, uh, actually one of the New Year's Six Bowls, I mean, you look at that, I mean, and you get passed up that yeah. bad during the Orange Bowl. I mean, that is kind of... Uh, that is kind of embarrassing, and that really kind of put, that, that really gave Dana Holtz a lot of uh, recognition to be a uh, very talented ACC teams like Clemson. Yeah, and, and his teams have kind of taken a little bit of a step back. The, the highest they've been able to finish it, and of course that was their last year in the Big East. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, the uh, highest they finished in the Big 12 is third, but this year with a little more of a wide open race, could they possibly be a sleeper team? Yes, because I believe uh, Will Greer being a senior, mm-hmm. yes. His leadership of the offense, I think, you know, in in the Big Twelve, if you can score points, you, you'll win the game. You'll, you'll nine times out of ten win the game. Yeah. So yeah. I think with you know being with him with Will Greer being a senior and hit him knowing the offense, like they're looking at back of this game, mm-hmm. I think I think they would. Do I see him in the championship game? Mm-hmm. Probably. I would put them. Say they lose lose championship game and still would that possibly put them in the playoffs? Uh, Maybe if probably not if they lost that Big Twelve championship game, but if they, uh, it'd be interesting yeah. to, to see. I think I think the Big Twelve champion is going to have to come out with one or fewer losses right. to make it. two loss Big Twelve champion. A right. two two loss yeah. SEC team could get in. I don't think a two loss Big Twelve. team. No, probably not. And just to answer your question here, I mean, I'll make a Georgia comparison just just talking about how how Jake Fromm and Javon Williams kind of paired up mm-hmm. as soon as they came in. They became basically inseparable, basically pass goes up to Williams, falls caught. It's the same way here with Will Greer and David Seals that you have written, yeah. mm-hmm. that you have written down. David here. Seals the fifth. Da- David yeah. Seals the fifth. Actually, if I, if I can remember right, I think David was actually a quarterback at one time okay. and actually was converted over to to, to play in receiver. And he's one of the star guys on the uh, West Virginia team. So I think, especially, I mean, of course, I know there's more talent on the offense, but those two guys in particular, Greer and Seals, seems, uh, seem to me that this year they're going to take the ball by the horns and run and basically make a big uh, make a big shot at winning the Big 12. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And uh, you got a... Uh... And Seals had 18 touchdowns, 60 catches. So. Yeah, uh, I rest my case with Seals. <laughs> yeah. And guys, they've got Gary Jennings, another top receiver, Marcus Sims, a deep threat. Oh, and they've added an Alabama grad transfer. So you know he's got talent. Yes, yes. T.J. Simmons. So I mean, they got. I would say them and Ole Miss probably compete for the for the top receiving cores in the mm-hmm. country. Yes. And, and so. They, they're going to be a fun team to watch. Uh, they lost a 1,061-yard rusher, Justin Crawford, so they've got to find a key running back. They're going to turn to Kennedy McCoy. That's kind of the guy they're, they're hoping to be the next. But they got a veteran offensive line. Uh, 
They've got six starters back on defense. But as we said, defense optional in the big yeah, yeah. But still, six starters back, that does give them a chance there. They have got to get a little better against the run as they struggled there. But uh, And they've got to take care of the ball because they turned the ball over 18 times in their last six games. That, it's hard to win. Yeah. That's three turnovers yeah. in the game. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so that, that, you know, it's going to be interesting. So they're going to be a fun team to watch. And I think we all kind of, uh, when we when we had uh, one of our podcasts where we talked about the uh, top 25, they were kind of mm-hmm. uh, one we talked about a good bit in that mm-hmm. podcast. So and, keep an eye out for and, it. Exactly. And I, I believe they have a chance in the Big 12. If, if, if any year is this year. Yeah, well, yeah it, it's a wide open. So uh, any more thoughts on West Virginia here before we move to, a, to another team? Well, no, I mean, not really. I mean, just the more we look at the more I look at these numbers, I mean, I haven't followed West Virginia that much. It's just the two people that I really look at is Greer and Seals from the times that I've watched them. But like you said, it is completely wide open. It's more wide open than really any conference in the Power Five this year. So I, I really do look for West Virginia to really make a run and possibly make an appearance in that in that conference battle game. Yeah, stay tuned. At the end of the show, we'll be making our picks. Yep. On, on See, it's, actually, it's actually going to get harder from here on out because we're covering by a whole conference at yes. a time. Is that we're going to be picking just the conference title matchup and who wins, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. We'll, we'll have divisions and the others to still pick yeah. all at one time, but this one, no divisions. So, exactly. A little, little tough. And another note, real quick, out of my knowledge of the Big 12, I, I believe West Virginia is one of the very few teams who have their returning quarterback starting this year. Great point. That could be a that could be a difference. That could be huge. You make a great because you look you're exactly right because Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and I believe Kansas State all three so, yeah. and there's some more teams as well. So and I'm going to bring up Texas here later, but I heard the other day that uh, Shane Buchel or mm-hmm. I yes, that's Texas, correct. Texas, Texas, he he didn't get chosen as a starting quarterback this year, so oh, there'll be a change there. Oh, so when we get to the Longhorns, we'll definitely. Get into that. All right, this segment on West Virginia brought to you courtesy of uh, Bank of Lumber City and Telford County Bank. And uh, they have been in our community since 1945. And uh, they are a full service bank. Uh, they offer personal banking, regular savings, commercial banking, money market accounts, online banking, child savings accounts, the, uh, loans, CDs. See the staff at. Uh, at uh, Lumber, Bank of Lumber City, also their branch here in McCray, Telford County Bank, and uh, thanks to uh, Troy Spiners and Stan Jones, Miss Virginia Hand, the whole staff there for their sponsorship, and glad to have them on, on board, and again, member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender, housing lender. so thanks. thanks to them. All right, guys, let's jump in, and we'll talk about the uh, the horn frog. How do you do that? It's something... Something of that nature. Miss Patty is like looking at us like. I mean, by all means, Mike, please don't throw up, accidentally throw up a game sign. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. But that's the horn frog symbol. Yeah. The, the, the TCU horn frog. Learning something new every day. So in uh, in 2017, they were 11 and three overall. They were 7 two in the Big 12. They were the Big 12 runner up. They got pasted by Oklahoma twice. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that's, a, that's the thing. You got the uh, prize. Oh, you made it to the Big 12 championship game. Yeah, I'm going to beat you again. Now. Let's go. <laughs> uh, but Gary Patterson, one of the mo- another. We talked about David Shaw and Chris Peterson. Just another consistent coach. Here. Exactly. Yeah. Another underrated coach. Yeah, very much. Very much so. I mean, it, I mean, ever since he really came into um, TCU, he's really turned. He's really made it into a great program, especially for any. For any coach that's there for 17 years, you know yes. you know he's doing something right. Exactly. Just to put it in short terms, like if he's there that long, he's doing something right. Yeah. At the beginning is 18th season, he is the dean of coaches in the Big 12 Conference. So, wow. That's I mean, it, quite a statement. They're coming off a big bowl victory where uh, they defeated Stanford 39-37 in the Alamo. They play two of the more... Uh, Exciting Alamo Bowls here in the last few years. Remember a couple of years back, the comeback against Oregon? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Where they were down huge at halftime and just made a tremendous. Uh, and guys, listen to this. The Horn Frogs have won 40 games over the last four seasons. Uh, that is right up there with, with, the, with the teams like uh, 
I mean, it's not, I mean, Alabama's above that, but they were in the same range as the USC's, Penn State's, Georgia's, uh, another team they were compared to Florida State as far as number of wins in that span. So, so he's obviously doing something right there. It, it, exactly. Um, like you said, he's the man of the coaches in the Big 12. And another thing is, I believe he's also been considered for other jobs, but yes. he's, he has remained faithful to TCU. And, you know, I say stuff it out, but I mean, there's been good times for him. There. Yeah. And, you know, if it's not broke, don't, don't, don't go somewhere else. And, and don't forget, the very first year of the college football playoff, they kind of got shafted. Yeah. If you remember, they were number three in the rankings the week before. And then when uh, when Ohio State crushed Wisconsin in that Big 12 championship game, uh, they got jumped and knocked mm-hmm. out of the uh, of the playoff. And so they were right there on the cusp. And that particular week, they went out and beat somebody like 70 to 30 mm-hmm. and still <laughs> fell in the rankings. So they were very close that year. Uh, he's always been solid. We talk about defense being optional, but if there is a school in the Big 12 that plays defense, it's TCU. I mean, without a doubt, I mean, to be honest, I mean Gary uh, Gary Patterson may may be really the only coach that really pushes yes. uh, pushes defense and like really be on his team. I mean I'm not saying that Dana Holgerson or uh, Lincoln Riley or anybody else that that, that they don't push defense. Yes, it's just yes. it's just TCU just really seems to um, have a certain skill mastered on that defense. It just makes them better than some of these other schools. I mean they, they seem they seem to be of a more consistent defense. As compared to the other ones in the conference, yeah, they, they always seem to have good pass rushers. Yeah. And you're right, Mike. This past year, when I watched a game or two of TCU, and you know, I, I, I figured, oh, they're going to brag on their offense, brag on their offense. They brag on their defense. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if that tells you anything about you know how we state Big 12 the offense, offense, offense. If just like y'all said, if, if anybody plays defense on the Big 12, it's TCU. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I mean, you think back uh, before they even came into the Big Twelve, those teams that the team that made the Rose Bowl that beat Wisconsin, and I believe they were in the WAC, and that was still in the Big CS days. Mm-hmm. But that team was known as a tremendous defensive team, yeah, one of the top in the country. So he's always solid there, and they're going to be led again by a, a linebacker, Ty Summers. Remember this name, folks. This kid, one of the top linebackers in the country, he's going to be a name name to watch. Uh, but let's walk over to the offensive side of all because you talk about quarterbacks. They're also a team that uh, Kenny Hill, Kenny the Thrill Hill, uh, he's gone, and so now they've got to turn to to a sophomore Sean Robinson. Mm-hmm. Sean Robinson, I mean, you know, honestly, I, I haven't heard, I, I haven't really heard of the kid, but you got to think, I mean. I went back and talked about whenever we talked about uh, was it Michigan? I do believe we talked. Uh, I can't remember what podcast we were doing, but we were talking about how Harbaugh would kind of have a hard time picking his uh, quarterbacks, and also at Stanford as well. How um, God, what's the kid at Stanford? Davis uh, Davis Mills. Yeah, he was like yeah. the, the kid from Georgia. That's yeah, the kid the, from Georgia on the roster. It's on the roster. We talked about him possibly. Uh, Costello, of course, the starter. Yeah, KJ Costello possibly going to come back this year and still start with the uh, with Stanford, but also the guy from uh, Red Atlantic Christian mm-hmm. talking about how if he could come in here and possibly keep his mind on the right path and also really try to get that quarterback mm-hmm. block from uh, Costello. It's the same way with him. I haven't heard a lot from him, but also if he comes in here and attacks it the right way, I mean, I'm sure he's going to put up a good year at, at, for numbers wise with TCU. And a lot of people are expecting some big things out of this kid. Yeah, well, what, what, is he a junior? He is a soft, soft, sophomore. Well, sophomore. You know, has a year under his belt of learning mm-hmm. offense. So, mm-hmm. I also expect the things. I mean, I don't know much about the kid, but if he, if he's anything like Kenny Hill and what, what he was to their offense, I expect another great year. Yeah, no doubt about it. They've got a couple of great running backs, Kyle Hicks and uh, Darius Anderson. They give them two solid backs. Uh, they've got to replace three starters on the offensive line. So if there is, we've seen in the past with the University of Georgia before they got this line they've got now, how critical if you don't have the offensive line, it don't matter how many skill players you have. Exactly. If you mean can't block for you, can't move to football. Exactly. 
So that's something they've got they've got to sure up. But uh, they've also got to replace some key personnel in the secondary. And in the Big 12 Conference, you better have people in the secondary right. that can cover. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, uh, as good as TCU's defense has been with them trying to um, get secondary people returning and trying to get some new guys in there that really know that defense well that can really uh, that's good at pass coverage and can keep up with receivers. I mean, yeah, especially with like we go back to the phrase high flying. Like that's no understatement. Like you better have some good defensive backs and a good safety. I mean, that that uh, defensive backs are crucial. Yeah, yeah. And and Patterson kind of is kind of a complex. They play a lot of that combo coverage, mm-hmm. uh, similar to what Nick Saban does, where where there's a lot of uh, uh, different uh, principles of man and zone combination. And that it, when a complicated system, it's already hard enough to play defensive back and put yourself in a system yeah. like that. It can be tough. Exactly. It's, it's a lot of, I hate to say, technique type deal. Yes, exactly. It's, it's hard to learn, but, you know, if you, if you learn it, you understand it, it can be, from the offensive side, it can be very tricky. Yes, yes, no doubt about it. Yeah, it's a lot of that, pat, what we call pattern read that Kirby Smart uses a lot, a lot of that as well. Uh, but, uh, guys, they have two great defensive ends, and we know TCU always gets after the passer. And uh, defensively, it's L.J. Collier and Ben bon- Bonagoo. Wow. So Bonagoo is going to get to your quarterback. You don't block him. So. Another interesting name. It, yes, yes. So any final thoughts on TCU before we, uh, before we move on to another team here? Well, yet again, TCU's got some, um, just like every team. I mean, every time that a uh, big class of seniors leave, they got some recovery to do. But yet again, I think TCU's, Going to be a contender. I agree. I, I agree. And uh, that segment on TCU brought to you courtesy of CL Defense. Best little gun shop in a uh, And, of course, uh, CL Defense, uh, they got you covered. Got you covered. And so uh, uh, see Chris and Lamar, and they'll treat you right on, on guns. Great prices on guns. And then, like you said before, they folks can show if he doesn't have it. He can get within the possibly two two to three days. I mean, basically, he's got he's got everything he wants. He just has to get a little PSA for him. Uh, he like he said yesterday in the um, post game show, he's got a overstock of luck. So if you want him, go get it from him. Yeah. Uh, ex- exactly. Yeah. All right. Why don't we uh, this next segment? We'll just combine it with the, both the Oklahoma schools. Okay. And so we'll look at Oklahoma State and Oklahoma. To start with we'll start with Oki State. 2017, 10 and 3 overall, 6 and 3 in the Big 12. They were the third place. Mike Gundy, 13 seasons. This is 14. They defeated Virginia Tech 30 to 21 in the Camping World Bowl. Guys, he's won eight bowl games in his in his tenure there. Uh, six double digit win seasons in the last eight. They were the 2011 Big 12 champion. So remember they uh they defeat did they defeat Stanford in that bowl game in the Fiesta Bowl? Thanks, so. I believe so. Kicked the field goal yeah, late, so. but uh, but they were that was a tremendous. That team was extremely close. Uh, other than an upset against Iowa State, they could have played for a national championship. Yeah, it, was, it was really good year for them. And that was, of course, the week of the the tragic uh, plane crash involving some of the people on the Oklahoma State on campus. You yeah. remember, so uh-huh. so that was a tough time for them, and they they had a great season. And uh, but they they are missing. One Mason Rudolph, who I was tremendously impressed with a year ago. Uh, same here, Mike. Uh, Mason, to me, uh, speaking of quarterback, some may consider him maybe that pro style type of quarterback. I agree. And, you know, in the Big 12, you think you've got to have a quarterback who can move around. Mm-hmm. But Mason was a pro style quarterback who had the ability to, you know, to get outside the ball mm-hmm. and to seek downfield and make those precise decisions on who to throw the ball to. He could make all the throws. All the throws, oh, right. right. I mean, and me too. Uh, I was a huge fan of Mason Rudolph, and I believe he's going to be a great quarterback. And he's a Steeler now. Yeah, obviously. that's right. So he, he could be the heir apparent yeah. to being exactly. Big Ben Roethlisberger. And of course, we talk about uh, Roethlisberger, who is out right now with a um, with a concussion. I do believe, mm-hmm. and so it's basically going to be between him and Landry Jones, former uh, former Oklahoma yeah, quarterback, that's right. uh, former uh, former uh, Sooner. But I mean, just Mason Rudolph. I mean, can't make a 
Kendall made a great, uh, good point. He's a, uh, he is agile. He's not your dual threat quarterback, which isn't a bad thing. He's able to extend that pocket, get mm-hmm. outside, look for a good throw. I mean, just he trusts his offensive line. You know, if they give him some time, he'll make a great decision. And he's one of the most accurate quarterbacks that I've really ever seen come out of the big world. Yeah, I, I agree. And he had two uh, really good receivers to throw to that are gone. Uh, they lost James Washington and Marcel Altman. Uh, these two combined for 2,700 yards and 21 touchdowns. Uh, so they got to look to a younger guy. Uh, that'll be Jalen McCleskey, who they hope to be the number one target for. Them. They do have uh, a back at running back, Justice Hill. Justice Hill and uh, former Fitzgerald. Yes. Purple Hurricane J.D. King. J.D. really does. I think I've seen you a couple mm-hmm. of videos before, and we've seen it live mm-hmm. on games before that J.D. really just continued his – Fitzgerald talent out there in the Big 12. I do believe it was like his sixth, first or second career run. He busted it out for like a 50 plus yard touchdown run. Yeah, he was, he was, remember we used on those tailgate shows just be at all of yeah. his numbers he was putting up at Fitzgerald. It was almost like he was running for 10,000 yards a game. No, no, no. Anyway, he, if, if you know Fitzgerald football, yeah. you, uh, this kid was, to me, Top chart. I mean, yeah. and just just make one little contenders point about him, and then we'll and then we'll move on. Is that um Justice Hill yet again? I do believe he got the majority of the snaps at running back. Mm-hmm. JD was also a great compliment. It was kind of that uh, girly Marshall yes. comparison, I guess you could good, say. Good comparison. Definitely. So, but also Justice Hill coming back is a big uh, big thing for them. And JD King will be another great compliment to Justice. But just but just all around, I mean, if if you want to talk about running back towards. In the uh, Big 12, the edge has got to go to OK, uh, to OK State. Now, I agree. They got L.D. Brown, too, mm-hmm. another top notch. Uh, defense coordinator uh, Jim Knowles is coming in. He's bringing in a new 4 2 5 lineman. So, very similar to what TCU does. Uh, maybe the Big 12's best pass rushers on this team in Jordan Brailford. So, keep a listen out for him. And they also have two really good outside linebackers, Calvin Bundage and Justin Phillips. They're real high on them. So they're looking to get better on, on defense. You know, the struggle there, they they, they they just need a little more defense. You know that Mike Gundy's team is going to put up points. Oh, yeah, well, without a doubt. I mean, we, uh, we referenced the matchup last year between these two teams here where um, 600-plus yards from both teams in that matchup with the, um, with the Oklahoma State and Oklahoma battle. Just uh, all around, Mike Gundy is a uh, great coach. Like that again, Another guy's there for uh, ten plus years. He's doing something right. Mm-hmm. He's but he's busting out a great team every year. I agree. And we did one thing I did mention: the quarterback battle is between Drew Brown, a uh, transfer from uh, Hawaii, and uh, also the the guy that backed up uh, Rudolph a year ago, and that is Taylor Cornelius. Mm-hmm. Looks like Cornelius probably has the edge there to win that job. So I would say so because I, I actually have watched a couple of them. Oklahoma State games, and I have seen Cornelius come mm-hmm. in there like if they want, like if they want to give Rudolph a rest, or uh-huh. or if they have a big point lead uh, late in the game. Cornelius really coming in there, and he's just basically picking up where Rudolph leaves off. Yeah, Mike, Mike Gundy doesn't get enough credit for what he's done there. All right, let's go across the state of Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma Sooners last year, twelve and two overall, eight one in the Big Twelve. We know they were the Big Twelve champs in Lincoln Riley's first season. And, of course, we know, as Georgia fans, what happened in the Rose Bowl. Oh, that was a pretty good game. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. As uh, Oklahoma, Georgia came back from a huge 17-point deficit to win that game 54-48 in double overtime. And, of course, the, the big question for the Oklahoma Sooners, who will replace one Baker Mayfield? All right, just right off the bat, I would probably say the uh, – the favorite or what it's mm-hmm. leaning leaning into about who will replace him, it's looking to be Kyler Murray. Yes. It's really looking to be Kyler Murray, especially like I talked about him in one of the early shows. Mm-hmm. I think I think this was before we started the preview. Yes. Yeah. Talked about Kyler Murray with him being drafted by the Oklahoma, Oklahoma the Oakland <laughs> Athletics. <laughs> by the Oakland Athletics. And, uh, there was a clause in his uh, contract where they said that he could go back to Oklahoma, play the 2018 season uh, as the quarterback, and that's if he chose to be the starter there about Lincoln Riley, and then he would have had to report to spring training that next year. 
So, I mean, right now, it's looking to be Kyler Murray because Kyler Murray was a great quarterback at, uh, was he at Texas? Uh, was he at Texas A&M? I think it was yes, that. yes. Transfer from yeah. Texas A&M. So, he, uh, so he got a couple of snaps there. He, I mean, he really made a, a good impression at Texas A&M with Kevin Sumlin as well coming in here. And just yet again, I mean, I'm comparing him. Uh, so uh, don't don't really disagree with me on this part. I'm comparing him at, to this person as an athlete, not a person. So. He kind of reminds me of James Winston because of him, actually, how, how good he can run around in the pocket, scramble and get some yards, and also a uh, dual-sport athlete as well, being the center fielder for the Oklahoma baseball team and the starting quarterback for the uh, football team as well. Just an all-around great athlete. Yeah, no doubt. I'd make a quick point there. It's, to, to me, it's, it's kind of inter- interesting you know, if he gets the nod of starting quarterback. He's on. He's under contract for the Oakland Athletics. Yeah, yeah. That's... So, so, say for example, now I sure don't hope this don't happen. But say he comes out and he ruptures his Achilles, he tears his ACL, or he, or he has some sort of season-ending injury. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm the general manager of the Oakland Athletics, I have a problem. I was gonna say if I if I was if I was the GM of the Oakland Athletics, well, I mean, like he said, yeah, I mean. The uh, the Oakland A's front office staff isn't going to be very happy with the university or Lincoln Riley <laughs> in particular. Yeah, that's true. Of course, the A's are allowing him to do this. Well, right. Yeah, they, they, they're allowing him to do this. So, I mean, if he were to get hurt, I don't necessarily want to call this blame, but take in mind, you let him do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. Yeah. All right, looking quickly, uh, they lost, you remember Mark Andrews, the outstanding tight end. They lost him, but they've got wide receiver Marquise Brown back, and they got running back Rodney Anderson, uh, who rushed for 1,100. He was impressive in the game against Georgia early on. He, he, uh, he was, was a freshman? I believe he was a freshman a year ago, so, yes. As a freshman, you know, you start, you're pretty good, at so that's, that's the guy to go to for this year. Yeah. They lost tackle Orlando Brown. We we all know how that critical that could be. Oh yeah, how Orlando, protect the quarterback. Yeah, Orlando Brown was honestly probably uh, one of the biggest offensive linemen, and on, one of the best, and one of the best and biggest offensive linemen that Oklahoma has really ever had. Especially on, uh, he's a pedigree of an offensive lineman. His father being an awesome offensive mm-hmm. lineman in the NFL, I believe, played for the Ravens at one time. I believe that's right. Uh, yeah. I can say that's the uh, team I remember it with, mm-hmm. but uh. Like I said, coming from a pedigree of uh, the same position, father being the great uh, lineman, and also Orlando looking to co- looking to continue his greatness in the NFL. Yeah. So that'll be a big, big That's hole to fill. A big hole to fill, and they've got to replace their best pass runners, rusher on Aronka Wu, uh, who uh, I mean he was a force last year. Oak Aronka Aronka Wu. The kid with the long last Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he, w- he was devastating at coming off the edge, and they hope that Mark Jackson can build that board. They, they're they pretty solid at corner with Norwood and Motley. Got question marks at safety. But guys, looking at it, Oklahoma's got some question marks. They do. And for a lot of people, really, they're the number one team. For some people, we think 12. So yeah. looking at their stats there, Mike, and the little bit that I do know, I can't say I'm putting this program. I know. That, I mean, you make a great point. I mean, it, it opens up the possibilities for a lot of teams. There's no doubt. Real quick, this segment on uh, the Oklahoma schools was brought to you courtesy of Telford County Middle School. I want to thank the middle school for coming on board. Middle school sports, we know, top notch. Uh, won a bunch of championships here in the last few years. And uh, as always, they do a great job. All right, quickly, we we got to move along because we got several more teams to cover, and we want to uh, get get through, and then we can go go lot to our live broadcast we're doing tonight. But uh, Texas Longhorns, seven and six last year, five and four in the Big Twelve. Tom Herman's first season, guys, they struggled offensively last year. They did, uh, and this is the second season, correct? Yeah, this is second. the second. Yeah, I was referring to last year. Oh, yeah, 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 you're yeah. right. Yeah, you know, last year it, it was a struggle. It was. But I think maybe it was an adjustment yeah. type period of learning the offense and you know, learning, for lack of a better way to put it, the Tom Herman way. Yes, yes. Learning his, 
his his standards and stuff. And I think then off season we saw the recruiting class that they brought mm-hmm. in. I think uh, it was top ten, correct? Yeah, yeah, he's right. So, so, man. so a top ten class. Uh, I think this is uh, proof of the direction of the program. I think this is the way the program is heading and it's tr- trending up. Yeah, and you make a great point because I believe they've got a, a top ten class for this next year right. in the works mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, Texas is coming back on the map. Right? It's just taking a little time. Right, you're exactly right. And Mike, uh, could you say that in year one of Tom Herman that Texas fans who were kind of disappointed with his first year, uh, do you think that they were automatically expecting Houston results like from his time there? Well, they're Texas. I mean, it's, it's Texas. I mean, it's Texas. I mean, you come in here and you start, and, and you get them. You get the nod in Texas. You're expected to come in here and have some great results. And you and you know those fans. They saw what he did at Houston, and it seems like they were automatically expecting that. Basically, you just need to pick up where you left off at Houston, and and that's not always going to happen. And it didn't happen. But like you said, they um, you got the recruit the recruiting classes getting tongue tied coming in. They're in the top ten. I mean, he's got some star people coming in. Seem that seems like he, they're going to be able to up some big help to him. And also, I mean, but one but one question mark that I'm sure you're going to yeah, lead yeah. into. Go, go, uh, right, go ahead. Just basically, that. one uh, one thing that's going to um, be a question mark for Herman this year is um, the quarterback battle, which I do believe Caleb said that he had already named a starting quarterback. And, it wasn't James Michelle. It, it was, was Ellinger, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, number 10, if I'm correct. Yeah, Sam Ellinger, who threw for 1,915 yards uh, last year. It's going to be, that's interesting. It is. It is. And uh, another thing, let's so go back. When well, you were talking about Tom Herman, I'm going to jump back to Charlie Strong just real quick. Right. Uh, when he was first hired, I believe it was one of the boosters. Mm-hmm. He made a side comment to a reporter or somebody, and he got out. They said this wasn't the guy we wanted. See, and that, and, and that, there's been a toxic situation yes. in Texas yes. with boosters and too much control. I think Mac Brown probably stayed a little too long. Yes. Mac's a great guy and he did great things, but the program got stale. And, and, and I don't think people realize how far down Texas was. Mm-hmm. He, it kind of just was a train wreck. It, it, well, it was going backwards. It, exactly. And so Tom Herman's got a building. I mean, it's, yes. it's, it's a more of a building job than people realize just because it's the University of Texas. Yeah, and for lack of a better term here, I'm going to use a phrase that ex-Tennessee coach used, Butch Jones. He's pretty much having to use, uh, go back brick by brick and get it back to where it was. Yeah, I actually saw today somewhere when I was reading about Texas, they were comparing them to Tennessee as far as the rebuilding job. So. Right. Uh, I think they got a little more talent though than Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, another thing, like with Coach Sean Herman, he's you know maybe not so much respect for this person or just in the name, but he's he's learned a lot under Urban Meyer. Yeah, from the from the football side of it, no doubt. I, I'm sure Tom Herman now kind of counting his blessings yes. that that he was he left. Ohio State yeah. before all of the situation happened there. And that's a very, very, very long story. Long story, yes. All right, real quick. They struggled in the running game. They've got to get more out of their running game. Uh, they've got some good running backs in Chris Warren and Daniel Young. Offensive line's got to step up. Uh, they uh, they got great defense, some mm-hmm. tremendous defense. They, they were one of the best defenses in the Big 12. And had they had any better offense might have might have had a lot better record. Forget don't forget they they lost in overtime to USC. That's right. The game they could have won. And so solid defensive guys Chris Boyd who's gonna be a star, probably all Big Twelve corner, and Gary Johnson. Remember Gary Johnson, the linebacker folks. Mm-hmm. Impressive young man had sixty tackles a year ago, expected even more out of him. All right, let's move along to Kansas State. We got Quickly, we'll try to run through these last few things. Kansas State, of course, coached by one Bill Snyder, who uh, begins his 27th season. Year number 27. (laughs) Man, so that right there is somebody that you would probably say is getting into the realm like of tenure, getting getting into the realm of possibly Paterno, maybe, in in that really realm. Because, I mean, how long was Paterno at Penn State? I mean, was it? 
A long I'm going to say a long time because I'm not real sure how long it was. And, and don't forget, Bill Snyder actually retired mm-hmm. and came back to K-State a few years later. And so a lot of people forget that. That We don't see that. Most of the time when that happens, you're not able to re, re, uh, re-energize and, and accomplish what you did before. Mm-hmm. Very true. A lot, of, a lot of schools now are trigger happy. Yes. With yeah. their coaches. Oh, it's a bad season. You're gone. Mm-hmm. You're gone. And with Bill Snyder, I, to be honest, I don't know a whole I know a little bit about K State, but not a whole lot. But with Bill being there for 26 seasons, like Jake said, the man's doing something right. Yeah. And, he, and, the, and it's a tough recruiting job out in Kansas. You have mm-hmm. to rely on a lot of junior college players. And he's been the master at doing that. Over the years, think back many years back, uh, Michael Bishop, a great quarterback that came out of there. So he's had a lot of success. And uh, he's going back more to a, a two-quarterback system, which he's done before and had success. Uh, Alex Dalton and Skylar Thompson. Thompson's more of the thrower. So they're going to rely on that. They've got to get better on third down. They struggled there a year ago. But one of the things when I think about K-State, I think about physical, hard-nosed football. They're not flashy. And they always play solid defense. And uh, they got a JUCO linebacker in uh, Daquan Patterson. They're looking looking at for big things. A, a University of Virginia grad transfer in Eric Gallant, and uh, also Elijah Sullivan. So again, he's mixing these grad transfers and JUCO players. And you know, he's just it's a trem- tremendous job that he's done there. And and they're solid. Don't count them out, guys. I mean, no, you're exactly right. I mean, Bill Snyder is Bill Snyder. I mean, I mean, he, when he makes decisions, I mean, he's doing that, of course, for the betterment of the program. But he's a smart coach. I mean, you don't stay somewhere for 27 years if you're if you're not a smart coach. And and guys, people forget back in 1998 that team was this close to playing for a national championship, and they were upset by Texas A&M in the Big 12 championship game. Or, or they or they would have made it. All right, quickly moving along. We're, we're, we're running out of time here. Uh, let's talk about the Iowa State Cyclones. They pulled off one of the biggest upsets in all of college football last year. They did uh, uh, upsetting the one and only Oklahoma Sooners. Exactly, Mike. Coach Matt Kemp? Yes. Which to me was... I thought when the Tennessee job come up, and I thought they're going to fly to Iowa State. I'm going to say, here's your team. It's time to sign. But they did. And, and I, I think a lot of, of Coach Matt Campbell, he, he, he signed an extension at Iowa State. Um, he's wrote the world name back for Iowa State in last, uh, this past season. He had a big win over Oklahoma. And not just not just that game, but throughout the whole season, they, they were, it was a good, really good season, and I, I think you know, I think they're still good. Uh uh-huh. yeah. I mean, everybody thought he was going to end up somewhere at a big right. job, but but he didn't. And they got a running back. Remember this name, David Montgomery, might be the second best running back in all of the Big Twelve. Doesn't get a lot of credit. Uh, they got a quarterback battle as well. Uh, quarterback Kyle Kemp returns. He threw for 1,700 yards, but they've also got a big-time recruit in Real Mitchell. Remember him. On the defensive line, 306-pound uh, Ray Lima. Uh, they've also got a uh, cornerback in Brian Peavy, who was their leading tackler, 88 tackles. Their biggest problem a year ago was they couldn't hold leads late. In, in, I, I... To me personally, I kind of speak that from a smaller type of school. Who, mm-hmm. You know, they don't they don't have what's a good way to put it. Uh, not that they don't have the quality of athletes. They just at times smaller schools struggle. You know, finish. Yes, finish. Yes. yes. And, and and we saw that a little bit last year with Iowa State. But I think you know again go back to the Oklahoma game. I, I believe that game went late. Yeah, and they, they come out of the war. So I think, again, this this is a team who is moving forward in a positive way. Yep, I agree. All right, real quick, Texas Tech, of course, coached by Cliff Kingsbury. 
in his sixth season. They lost the Birmingham Bowl to South Florida. Guys, everybody thought Cliff Kingsbury was going to get the axe last year. And, you know, honestly, it, it, it was starting to look that way. But, I mean, Cliff Kingsbury, who is, um, which, of course, I mean, he's not no veteran head coach by no means. He's, I think he's like the third youngest coach in, yes. in college mm-hmm. football. I think uh, just right above him is uh, P.J. Fleck. And then there's one one other guy who's at a smaller school who is the youngest guy in college football. I mean, but Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury, which I do believe he knows what he's doing, but of course, if he probably has one more uh, below average year, he may get the axe, to be honest. But I mean, but I've got but I got faith in Cliff Kingsbury, but I know you know, Texas Tech is one of the schools that really have more question marks than a lot of other teams in this conference right now. But I, but I think. I, I'm hoping Cliff can make an improvement. The, they should score points. I know they, they've got to find a new quarterback as well. Uh, but uh, it'll be interesting to say they've got uh, McLean, Carter, Jet, uh, Duffy, both of them. Probably Carter, I would say, is going to get the edge at quarterback. But everybody's excited because for once, Texas Tech may finally have a defense. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's going to start with Dakota Allen, one of the best all-round outside linebackers. Uh, also, they got Jordan Brooks, a big thumper in the middle, a linebacker. Uh, with these two, they combined for almost 200 stops a year ago. Rico Jeffers uh, is looking like another one that's going to be a top. So with the defense to go with the offense, maybe this could be the year that Texas Tech can take another step. Oh, yeah, I believe so, you know. Just to give credit to Athlon Sports right here for what I'm about to read, um, it says Kingsbury struggled to field a successful defense during his five-year tenure, but there are signs that coordinator David Gibbs has this unit moving in the right direction. So it says in 2017 they allowed 32 uh, points a game. That's down from 43 points a game in the previous year. It says with nine starters back, which is a good thing, uh, they're moving forward in a re- uh, with nine starters back, another step forward in a realistic expectation. So, and also, high-powered, uh, high-powered offenses are a tangible tradition in Lubbock. But the 2018 unit features more questions, uh, question marks at quarterback, like you said, and receivers as well. This was an opener against Ole Miss and five Big 12 road games. Uh, they have little margin for error this year. Yeah, they're going to be really tested. Really looking forward. There might be uh, 70, 80 points scored per team in that old Miss <laughs> Texas Tech game. Probably so. My, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Real, real quick point uh, from, I believe, what you and have the same information. Uh, according to this, it says one the position group on offense that uh, is solidified heading into the fall is the offensive line. Yeah, so, so that, that could be huge for them, especially with breaking in a new quarterback. You, you've got. Gotta have, gotta have a solid offensive line there. All five of those starters will return this year. All right, so so that that could be a huge key for them. All right, real quickly, Jacob, we got two more teams to cover, and that is uh, Kansas and Baylor, uh, the two bottom feeders in the conference. But run down a little bit on them, and then we'll jump into our predictions so we can uh, wrap up and get ready for our live. Well, with Athlon Sports in their top one thirty for twenty eighteen, the Jayhawks are ranked uh, one hundred and sixteen. Um, so, if one wants to take the optimistic view of Kansas' upcoming season, it starts with this. The Jayhawks, according to Bill Connolly's research at uh, SB Nation, they return a combined 91% of their offense and defensive production from last season. The second highest mark nationally behind only Michigan State, though that usually portends good things that there's a lot of, of ground for KU to make up. Since for the fourth consecutive year under Kansas coach uh, Dave Beatty, did I pronounce yeah, that right? Yeah. Since the Jayhawks were in their fall camp, unsettled at quarterback, former junior college transfer Peyton Bender returns after an in- inconsistent first year with Kansas, and he was pl- replaced by or replaced late by more mobile Carter Stanley, who didn't perform any better. Uh, the five foot ten Miles Kendrick will enter the year after, um, after leading College of, uh, of San Mateo to the California State Championship game last season. Says with better help, KU's running backs have potential to be the uh, to be the team's best position group this year. And also at receiver, you got Steven Sims as the team's top returning playmaker after earning the Jayhawks' highest offensive grade from college uh, from college football pro uh, pro focus in 2017. The uh, Houston Speedsters 59 catches, nearly double 
than any of other any of his other teammates. While he has 839 yards, catching the six touchdowns, and just basically looking at the final analysis from Halfline here, it says KU finishes one and eleven in 2017 with its only win coming in the season opener against F FCS opponent Southeast Missouri State. This is um. Uh, Beatty's record stands at 3 and 33 in three seasons. So, uh, threes are wild there. Uh, with, only, with his only FBS win coming against Texas in 2016, says the stakes will be high in 2018. If KU struggles to start this season, the move could, move could come in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you're a Kansas fan, uh, what, when does basketball season start? I think that's the more common question. Uh, but now moving along to the Baylor uh, Baylor Bears real quick, and then we'll make our predictions. Uh, let's see. Let me get that word. Of course, coached by Matt Rule. Oh yeah, the uh, the Bears are ranked number 53 in the top 130 for athletes. Of course, Baylor will be the Big 12's most improved team in 2018. The Bears were one of the youngest programs in the league last season and suffered some bad bad luck in losing five five games by 10 points or fewer. Matt Rule's rebuilding efforts is far from complete. But there should be uh, tangible signs of progress in 2018, possibly even a trip to a bowl game. Okay. So, so maybe they can take a step and uh, trying to clean up a situation there as well. And it says in the in the revolving door that is the Baylor quarterback position, sophomore Charlie Brewer is the next man up after getting four starts under his belt during last year's one and eleven disaster. Uh, the sixth different starter at this position since Bryce Petty led the Bears to back-to-back Big Club championships in 2013 and 2014. That's probably Baylor's best quarterback in the past couple of years, to be honest. And you got uh, Brewer passed for 1,562 yards and 11 touchdowns and earned Big 12 co-offensive freshman of the year honors. So the only other scholarship quarterback in the spring was early enrollee freshman uh, Jerry Bohannon from tiny Earl, Arkansas. Jalen McClendon, a grad transfer from North Carolina State, is set to join the team in the summer. Let's see, you got, uh, also for offensive line, you said, um, you got, they added Clemson transfer, Jake, uh, Prue Morgan to a group that includes a converted tight end, Sam Tecklenburg at center. You got Blake Blackmore and Xavier Newman at, at the new guards and tackle, and Pat Lewis at, at the tackle position. Final analysis was, uh, to really wrap it up. Says playing with a chip on their shoulder after last year's 11, a one and 11 finish, the Bears should be able to get off to a higher start and make a run to their eighth bowl bid in nine years. But staying healthy will be the key. All right, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there to see if they can turn it around. All right, guys, I tell you what, why don't we instead of trying to pick all ten teams, do we want to just do maybe the top top? Four in the conference. Does that does that sound good to you guys? Yeah, I was gonna say possibly top four and then probably pick uh, pick who wins. And pick, pick who wins it. Yeah. I was gonna say and pick the championship matchup who wins it. Okay. All right, guys. So we'll move across the board. All right. Uh, since you've got, oh, do you want to say who you're worth? I'm, I'm gonna yeah, I'll go first. I'm gonna go at fourth, West Virginia, and surprisingly, I'm gonna put OU third. I think there's too many question marks. I think TCU. And their defense will be good. I think Oklahoma State wins the Big 12. They play TCU in the Big 12 championship game. And uh, the Okie State Cowboys win it all. That, that's my prediction. Okay. Uh, number four, I'm going to go to Oklahoma number four. Like you said, Mike, there's, to me, uh, Oklahoma, have they, they have more questions than they do answers at this time. Uh, at number three, I'll go. I'll go West Virginia. Number two, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say Oklahoma State, and then uh, TCU. Number one. Okay. All right. All right. Jacob gets last chance here. Well, going at number four, I'll have to go with Kayla and say that Oklahoma's gonna uh, be at fourth. I mean, I'm looking for big things from Kyler Murray this year, but I just don't think they'll get it done. So uh, going at number four will be Oklahoma. Number three. Um, I'll probably have to say, um, all right, in the Pac-12, I made a big move. Uh, I made a big move, so I'm going to pull another Tim here. I made a big move, and let's just see how I do here. At number three, I want to see, 
Well, you know, I'm going to play it safe. I'll take that back home. <laughs> West Virginia, I do believe they'll make a push, but they'll fall short. They'll make a push. But, I mean, hey, I could be wrong. If they make it in, I'll feel better. So, and also, at number two, I'll say TCU coming in at number two, and Oklahoma State going to have another big year and finish first in the Big 12. All right, guys, so a little, we, we're, none of us are high on Oklahoma, so we got Oklahoma State uh, that I picked, Jacob went Oklahoma State, Caleb went TCU, and we, we all had them two in the championship game. All right, real quick, thank our sponsors uh, that make this possible, Deep Productions, Deep and Deeper Cleaning, Telfair County Middle School, Telfair County Chamber of Commerce, Merchants and Citizens Bank, CL Defense, Bank of Lumber City, and Telfair County Bank, so. Thanks to all these sponsors. A great preview, guys. Oh, yeah. And now we're about to get ready for a live show. So any final thoughts before we get it out of here? I mean, this show right here was great. I mean, I, I love previewing the Big 12. It's like uh, We've all said this before. Once we get further and further closer to the East Coast, we're going to know more and more about yeah. it, and we're going to talk more and more about it. And it's just going to be easier to really make our pitch and talk uh, and talk who really will make a push for their conference style. But this right here was a blast. And I'll, uh, now we're getting ready to go live, preview this upcoming game tomorrow night. Any thoughts, Kevin? All right. Uh, well, Big 12 is another conference that's, that's good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, people right here don't necessarily watch it, but college football in, in general, as a whole, is good. If, you, if you're a fan, you know what I'm talking about. If not, you should tune in and watch the game. It's, it's, it's exciting every Saturday. That's right. All right. That'll do it for our preview. Stay tuned for the Big Ten preview coming up next.